Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Piece 1001, 1001 chapter review. We start off with Jinbei in the cover page, and I really love the black background in this because to me, it just kind of makes it seem as if he's surrounded by anglerfish. He just doesn't know it yet. And then also the faces on the jellyfish, again, remind me of, well, Black Maria's spider for one, but then also Big Mom's homies. We start off the chapter and it's confirmed that Luffy's Red Rock attack was in fact using Rio. And I feel like the anime is gonna do a much better job at showcasing when Rio is being used versus when it's not. That's one of the things about the manga is that you can't really tell sometimes. And because Red Rock uses fire, just like Red Hawk does, I mean, the attack should technically go through anyway because it's using fire. Like in Dressrosa, we see Red Hawk bypass Doflamingo's defenses and come out the other side. And that's just because it's fire. So even without Rio, I had assumed that that's what had happened with Red Rock. But apparently Red Rock is also Rio plus the fire. Apparently Kid doesn't know how to use Rio, which kind of makes sense given his personality. I've said this before, but each time Oda has shown us an advanced level of hockey, whether it be Observation, Future Sight, or Rio, Advanced Armament, in order for the user to be able to learn how to use those advanced type of techniques, he has to be in a serene, calm, peaceful state of mind. And Kid's personality is too rigid. Like, he's too feisty and easily provoked. And so as we see in this chapter, since Luffy has Rio, since Zoro and Killer have their blades, and since Law has Gamma Knife, which is essentially a type of attack that inflicts damage from the inside out, I think it's obvious that Oda's gonna have to get creative with Kid's electromagnetic techniques in terms of how he can use Kid's Devil Fruit power and find a way of applying it so that he can deal some damage to Kaido. And we already saw like some of that creativity begin to blossom in this chapter. I also think this chapter makes it obvious that if Kid can make a robot that is big enough, he can probably use it to wield a giant sword at the front of Onigashima and maybe fight Napoleon with it. Now, if I had to guess in terms of what's gonna happen next, the fights in One Piece, they typically build up towards Luffy in every arc. So from a structure standpoint, I think Oda's gonna be treating the five supernova at the top kind of like how he treated the scabbards, where we go downstairs for a while, we see what's happening inside of the dome. Uh, I think we're gonna have to start getting through the fights with the Topi Ropo. The momentum is gonna start building from Ulti and page one. And occasionally, we'll cut in and out to the roof to get some updates. But yeah, I can definitely see like that sort of structure similar to what we got with the scabbards while Luffy was trying to get up to the roof. And then once we hit uh, King and Queen, once the Topi Robo are dealt with and King and Queen are defeated, that's when I feel like Oda's really gonna focus in on Luffy versus Kaido. And I really feel like I need to talk about the number five. Like, wh what is it about this number? It's, it's been three chapters in a row where five characters get singled out. In 999, Ace mentions five people that are beginning to make a name for themselves or that will make a name for themselves. Luffy, Kid, Law, Cavendish, and Capone. In chapter 1000, there's five supernovas that get up to the roof. And in this chapter, like literally, Kaido looks at Luffy and he thinks about five people, specifically five pirates, which this is why I'm assuming he wasn't thinking about Garp because Garp was right there with Roger at God's Valley, but Kaido doesn't think about him. So I'm assuming what makes the difference here is that these five characters, these five top tiers, they all have bounties or had bounties. Even if you don't consider Odin to be a pirate, he still had a bounty. He got it while he was traveling with Whitebeard. So yeah, it seems like these are all pirates. I think it's kind of obvious, you know, just based on the placing, who Kaido considers to be like the top tier of the top tiers. Roger and Whitebeard, those are the ones at the top. It's definitely not the first time that Oda has shown Kaido acknowledging Roger and Whitebeard because in chapter 970, Kaido actually tells Odin, he says, you remind me of somebody. Newgate and Roger were like you too. Mighty pirates, but soft in their way. I also like how there's this sort of vertical line that traces the trajectory of the straw hat. Like it goes from Roger at the top to Shanks in the middle, down to Luffy. And of course we know that Shanks intercepted Kaido from going to Marineford, but the thing got squashed fairly quickly. So I'm assuming that's where Kaido saw a glimpse of Shanks' power. So Oda wasn't kidding with the 2021 Shanks hype train. Because out of the five, if Rox is in fact dead, 
then Shanks would be the only one alive. And it's also kind of how you hype up Teach, too, because if Teach takes down Shanks, whoa! I mean, granted, it depends on how he does it, right? Because knowing Teach, he'll probably play dirty. And then Rox is in there, too. And Rox is like Teach's idol. Teach wants to be like Rox. I can just imagine like a flashback of cabin boy Kaido. Apprentice level Kaido trying to sneak up on Rox just like Ace would sneak up on Whitebeard. Now in the official translation, Kaido says, there's only a scant few who can fight me. Scant means limited. So there's only a limited few who can fight me. And that's where he thinks about the five. However, Kaido does not say, these are the only five, the only people in the world who have been able to fight me. And so that's why I think somebody like Garp isn't there because Garp is a Marine and he's only thinking about pirates. Plus, I feel like it's obvious that he's kind of like, you know, not including other people that are top tier as well. Like Big Mom is in part of the five and she was able to fight Kaido. Then again, she's right there. So really, I think what it comes down to it is that Kaido is thinking about top tier pirates that are not currently present. So the image of the five would not include top tier Marines or revolutionaries or anything like that because those five are being based off of Luffy being a pirate. Oi, Mugiwara, Raimi, future sight, ow! As we learned from Sasuke's Sharingan, just because you're capable of perceiving your opponent's movements doesn't mean you're fast enough to dodge them. So he does kind of get him on the forehead, but he gets back up. And I like how Kaido sort of praises Luffy a little bit after that. He's like, very good boy. You won't get hit by the same thing twice. I like it. However, I do think that this chapter makes it clear that if it weren't for Law and Zoro, Luffy would have taken some damage here. Like, he would have taken a swing by Kaido, and he would have taken Mom's Heavenly Fire as well. And fire gets dealt with a lot in this chapter. It turns out Zoro can cut it now, using Firefox style, and I'm very curious as to when he actually had time to learn it. He's actually using Sandai Kitetsu to cut it, so I'm assuming he must have learned the technique during Luffy's time in Whole Cake Island. And just to add a little bit more context here to Heavenly Fire, I'm pretty sure that all of the members of the Monster Trio should be able to deal with this, if not tank it. And we know this because in Whole Cake Island, Big Mom essentially hits Reiju with it. And it does burn her and sends her crashing down, but at the end of the day, she essentially tanks it because she does a lot more after that. It's not like she's knocked out or anything. So if Reiju took it with the Raid Suit, I'm pretty sure that means that Sanji should be able to take it as well. And so even if Zoro hadn't cut the fire to protect Luffy, Luffy would have been able to take it. Like, he would have gotten some damage, but he still would have been okay. In fact, he still gets hit by fire in this chapter because he's goofing around. I feel like that was Oda being like, well, I didn't get to do the cringe face with Luffy during the beginning of the arc, you know? So I'll find another way of working in a weird face for him. And this is the result of that. I think that's super relatable though. I think a lot of us have been in situations like that, especially when we were younger, where like we were trying to prove our manhood. And so we did stupid stuff like that to like not flinch. The cherry on top is definitely Zoro's reaction to it. What are you doing? We're fighting to your call. Now, that being said, there is a pattern, right? That Oda establishes with these action sequences as specifically the ones involving Luffy. So if you notice, right, let's, let's recap. He barely is able to dodge the Thunder Bagua, right? Then Zoro has to come in and cut the fire for him. Then Law has to switch him out, out of the way of Kaido's attack. So to me, that's Oda kind of making a point, you know? Like, he's repeating the same point three times. Then again, I don't know if Luffy would have been able to dodge the Thunder Bagua fully, like 100% no damage, if he had been in Gear 4. Like, we don't know that, but I think the point still stands uh, because he's repeated it with enough examples, which is, to me, I think the point is obvious. And to me, like, it feels like Oda is saying Luffy has to be able to dodge these things better. So we're talking speed feats now, right? So whatever power-up Luffy gets, whether it's Awakening, Gear 5th, or both, it has to boost up Luffy's speed. I think that's very clear. It's made perfectly clear in this chapter. Either that, either it's going to get a massive speed boost or he's gonna be able to develop his observation hockey to the point where he can see the future much more in advance. I do think it's gonna come down to the massive speed boost though, because Snake Man, Gear 4 Snake Man, if you remember, like before he even revealed it, 
Like everybody was predicting that that was going to be his speed mode for Gear Force. And it technically was. It technically was a speed boost, but it was mainly a speed boost for Luffy's arms and punches, right? It was mainly about Luffy being able to extend his limbs at a faster speed so that Katakuri wouldn't be able to detect where the attacks were coming from. And that's what Snake Man does. But I feel like ultimately Gear 5th or Awakening, that has to be a speed boost for Luffy's entire body. I don't wanna say it's gonna be like teleportation or anything like that, but teleportation. Or it could be like a Katakuri thing where he's able to mold his body to avoid getting hit. But again, the same logic still stands. Oda made it clear in this chapter, Luffy has to be better at dodging. Kaido stops Big Mom from interfering with the supernova, which is very convenient, but it's also very in character. Because as we know, Kaido has been yearning for a good fight. Like he wants a good challenge, right? He wants to find a worthy enough opponent like Odin because he's so bored and thinks the world is weak. So Zoro and Killer go for it, and I think Oda brings up a really good point during this scene, which is that during the Kamaso fight, there were a lot of people saying, myself included, that Zoro was nerfed during that fight because not only was his stomach messed up, but also he didn't have his three swords. He ended up using a scythe that he took from Kamaso. But the point that Oda brings up here is that Killer was also nerfed during that fight because he didn't have his blades either. So I never really thought about it from Killer's perspective, and that does make sense. Like, that is a valid point. Because if you use blades, or if you're a swordsman, I've always heard swordsmanship being described as, like, you kind of have to think about the sword or your blade as an extension of your own body. It's like part of your arm, almost. So if you had to get used to a new set of limbs, that would take some adjusting. And so I definitely see where Killer is coming from by him feeling that he was nerfed. That being said, would the fight ended any differently had Killer had his blades? No, I don't think so. I like how Zoro doesn't argue back by saying, well, you know, at the time I was missing Shusui too. And also my stomach was giving me problem, no nothing. He doesn't say anything like that. He just says, it would have ended the same way. Let's just move on. Our hands are already full. We got a job to do right now. Santoryu Rengoku. Now, the cool thing about that is that despite Zoro and Killer's attack not doing much of anything to Kaido, we do get a perfect idea of what Zoro is trying to do here, what Zoro's goal is. Right off the bat, we know. If you go to the manga, don't go to the anime because the anime censors the blood, so you can't really see it. But if you go to the manga, it's chapter 646 for Hiozo, chapter 938 for Killer. If you go to those chapters, you'll see that every time that Zoro uses Rengoku Onigiri, the attack leaves an X mark on the opponent. Now, if you look at where Zoro is aiming his attack in this chapter, you can clearly see that Zoro is aiming for the right side of Kaido's abdomen which is exactly where Kaido's scar happens to be. So right from jump, we know exactly what Zoro's gonna be trying to do. We know exactly what his goal is, what his intentions are. He wants to reopen that scar. Killer's the one who actually wants to cut Kaido's head off, but Zoro, he's more focused, concentrated on the scar. That's what his game plan is for this beginning portion of the fight. Luffy, Law, and Kid get back up. They each get their own individual panel ready for battle, starting with Kid, Punk, Rotten, Gyat, Fourth, Room, and Kaido's looking kind of excited. He's like, bring it, boys. Now, I kind of like how Kid's machine, robot thing, which, by the way, reminds me a little bit of Dr. Eggman, uh, but that, I'm assuming, is like Kid's version of Gear Fourth, so that's like his equivalent to Gear Fourth. And then Law is over there going like, Hey Kaido, can I interest you in some pointy rocks? <laughs> Granted, Law does sort of make a comment that alludes to Gamma Knife. So maybe there's more to his attack than meets the eye. But if all he's doing is just throwing these sharp, <laughs> pointy rocks at Kaido, I kind of question the use of it. Especially because we, we just saw Killer and, and Zoro trying to cut Kaido with their blades. And, and they didn't really do much of anything. So what are some pointy rocks going to do? I, I don't, well, then again, Law didn't really see Zoro and Killer attack Kaido. So maybe that's why he's trying it. I don't know. I, I'm willing to give Law the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he has like a, a secret strategy involving those rocks. 
I hope. Because in the official translation, he does say, I will go straight inside the body to deliver a surgical death. So yeah, that right there is like very clear foreshadowing that something was up with those rocks. They weren't just normal pointy rocks. I was kind of confused in the beginning of the chapter with Law because in the very first page, he has this bit of dialogue where he says, I have one thing to say or something like that. And then it cuts off and I was like, wait, what, what was Law going to say? But then I realized that it was, it was basically him complaining to Luffy that, you know, he didn't want to make it seem as if like he was following his orders. So it was just a complaint. In the beginning of this video, I was talking about like my curiosity in terms of how Oda was going to use Kid to deal some damage to Kaido, given that he doesn't know Ryo. And so, you know, he has a bit of dialogue where he says, we know your skin is tough, but can you survive being compacted to death? So it seems like Kid is going to try to asphyxiate Kaido, squeeze the breath out of him, by adding some pressure with his metal. After that, we get three double page spreads. I really liked the structure that Oda used for this final part of the chapter because the first double spread that we get is of the supernova rising over Kaido. The second one, the one in the middle, is of the supernova landing their attacks on Kaido. And then the last page is of the Yonko rising over the supernova. It's like a three act structure sort of a thing with those final double page spreads. And I thought that was very smart structure wise. Luffy uses Kong gun and the shockwave that the attack sends out is very similar to the shockwave that Hyogoro sends out when he uses Ryo. So I'm assuming the Kong gun has Ryo as well. And then Kid uses a squashing attack called Punk Vice. Now I actually did some research and I found that there's actually a British band called Vice Squad that was formed in 1979, early 80s. It's an English punk rock band. And so I looked up their logo and it turns out that some of the art that they use, especially for one of their album covers called Battle of Britain, that design looks a lot like the machine monster that Kid makes in this chapter. So that could be the inspiration for it. Also, if you spell out the word Vice, the way it's written in the official translation, which is V-I-S-E, that's also the name of this tool right here which is used to compress stuff. So it's kind of cool how the name of the attack could potentially have a double meaning. Anyway, Law uses tact to bring down the pointy rocks on Kaido, and then Kaido comes out of that rubble once again in dragon form. I'm not really sure why he's using dragon form again. I mean, we already saw how it plays out up against the scabbards. I'm guessing it's just for fun. Like, this, this chapter was a lot of fun, I'm not gonna lie. Now, I'm assuming that this dragon form won't be able to fly because... Kaido is currently using his fire clouds to lift up the island, right? So if you look at that final panel, it could be that he's just touching the ground, actually crawling on the ground. Because the way I understood it was that he was using his fire clouds to lift Onigashima. And so therefore he can't use them on himself because he's lifting up the island. Or can he? Like, does Kaido have like some spare fire clouds that he can use on himself as well. Like, I guess what I'm asking is, is this a nerfed dragon form Kaido? That's what I'm asking. Also, if you look at Big Mom's dialogue recently, man, she has been thirsting for these poneglyphs. <laughs> like, it, a couple of chapters back, she was talking about like, oh, oh, Kaido, do whatever you want. Just don't kill Robin because we need Robin to read the poneglyphs. And then also when Kaido said, oh, I'm just gonna put this island down, over in the flower capital. And then Big Mom was like, is that where the road Poneglyph is? And then in this chapter, she's like, we know you have Poneglyphs too. So that woman really wants those glyphs. Like she is hungry for those stones, man. It almost gets me to think that she just wants to get the Poneglyphs and leave. Like she doesn't care about the fighting or anything like that. The Alliance was just like an excuse. She's just like, I'll just take this rock. I'll just, you know, take this scrubbing. I'm a bounce. You know how in the beginning of the chapter, Big Mom tells Luffy, do you even know what it means to be Pirate King? Because I thought that she was going to say, it means getting those dang poneglyphs. This chapter made me feel like I was watching the beginning of the Super Bowl, where there was a brief warm-up session. The players are now on the field. You know, they're getting used to the ground, getting their feet wet. It was a whole lot of fun, just action beat after action beat. And this is the Super Bowl. This is what we pay tickets for as One Piece fans. I've already read some comments saying that this should have been chapter 1000 
And I don't know about that. Like, I feel like this was a great action chapter to start off the fight against Tu Yonko. But at the same time, I think like chapter 1K was more thematically relevant. I thought that was a very strong chapter thematically, whereas this is a much stronger chapter action wise. Either way, it's some really solid stuff. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you liked the video, you know what to do. Take care, and I'll catch you guys later. Bye.